We'll hear argument in three cases this morning. First is 
straying back into the question of breach, but there was no evidence of any reliance on the hospital to sufficiently warn the, uh, the county. Uh, no evidence that, uh, that... I just want to make sure that what Ruby has is to have to take this That's correct, Your Honor. So really, we don't need to even worry about what they did or whether they thought they should do something. As a matter of law, they had no obligation to do that because they had no obligation to do that. That's correct. How about putting up that sign that is at least arguably could have impaired the vision of the driver of this truck? Well, that was an exercise of some degree of control uh, over the right-of-way. And if that had been the source of a causal breach, then there might have been liability. So that that seems to me that that leads us back to breach too, as opposed to you're, you're if I'm understanding you're saying, yeah, there's a duty that was created by the hospital by putting something on the road, a sign that could obstruct vision. So the question then becomes, did it have the causal thing? But that's not a question of duty anymore. It's more a question of your honor's analyzation correctly. And would the same be true of the concrete pad that was put on the right of way on the other side? Yes, there, there is no question that we did that and we did it in the county right of way, and so to that extent we control the right of way. And so if, if that is a, um, if that's an assumption of actual control over the right of way, which is one of the exceptions that the Court of Appeals identified, then wouldn't the question be, uh, well, is, did that cause, what did I contribute to, to cause it or not? rather than a causation question, rather than a duty question. That's correct. So whether they had a duty to address any risk created by the sign or the concrete uh, pad, uh, whether or not they had a duty to do that, your position is it did not create any duty beyond well, conceivably, if, if I place a sign in the public right-of-way, I might possibly have a duty to warn someone that that sign is there. Uh, I think for the motorist ex uh, exit. There may be dangers behind the sign that you can't see. Right. You know, be careful coming out of this parking lot or something like that. Uh, our point on both the pad and the signs is not that there was no duty at all with respect to those. It was that they have nothing to do with the facts of this case and the causation of the but then your And then your next point is, and beyond that, what did they do? If there was no duty. Exactly. Exactly. We all probably learned in law school the hypothetical of the passerby who sees someone drowning in a public lake or a public river. And, and there's no duty in that situation. And that is not dependent on the particular facts. I could be an Olympic swimmer. I could have nothing better to do that day. I could have written to the county 12 times about prior incidents where people nearly drowned. Uh, and I would still have no duty. It might be morally repugnant if I didn't intervene. What if it's that the, your, your house is adjacent to that lake? It's not your lake, uh, but the only way your employees have come to, to things for you is to swim across the lake. And they're, they're, they're proceeding with it. So, same thing. Well, same thing uh, for a couple of reasons. We, we've cited uh, cases in our brief about the lack of any duty to configure your premises so as to minimize the danger to people on adjoining public property. Uh, the dangers of swimming across a lake are, are well known. Conceivably, if there's some terrible undertow or something in the lake, that would qualify under the fourth exception for an obscured danger known to the uh, defendant. But that's not what we have here. Uh, the dangers of pedestrian vehicle interactions on a public right of way uh, are, are well known and they're not. They, these were not amplified the dangers. Was that not the reason that the hospital wrote to the, the county? No, the reason the hospital wrote to the county was that so many accidents were, pedestrian vehicle accidents were happening. That makes it sound to me like it's different from just, I mean, you, you just said that the dangers of, of walking on the road are well known, which is certainly true, 
but this seems like the point you just made now is in tension with it because the point is, well, there's a higher than usual frequency of these accidents, hence we now know something that maybe... Well, well there's nothing don't. obscure about that. Uh, you know, if I'm crossing a public right-of-way, I know that there is some degree of danger, be it small, be it large, depending on the circumstances, uh, and I am on notice that I need to do what I need to do to protect myself. We all know that there are careless drivers out there. We all take a degree of caution when crossing a public street. Uh, that's something that uh, hopefully every kindergartner knows, but uh, certainly every adult knows. And if I, I understand your point now to be that there was some duty in the right of way because of the sign and because of the pad, um, but that there's no duty in the public road. And if we were to agree with you on that, would we need to remand to the Court of Appeals? Uh, because we only have two issues from you. One is duty, uh, the duty in the roadway, and the other is the, um, uh, the one about uh, workers' comp. And I don't think we have an issue before us about whether there was sufficient evidence to support the jury's verdict on the duties that arose from the sign or the pad. So what would we do with those? Well, our point on those is a no evidence point, Your Honor, and it is included in our, uh, our issues presented. Was there any evidence that HMC assumed actual control of the political roadway and that such control approximately caused Chan's death? So our point on that is a no evidence point. As to the signs, the evidence was undisputed that before he commenced his turn, Mr. Budd had pulled forward sufficiently that he could see clearly in both directions. He looked to the left, he looked to the right, and then he looked straight ahead as he commenced his turn. Uh, that was his testimony. That was the testimony from the only eyewitness who got into the subject. Uh, and there was consequently no evidence that the presence of the sign approximately caused uh, Ms. Chen's death. Uh, the same with respect to the concrete pad. There was no evidence whatsoever that this particular uh, path was chosen by Ms. Chan because she said, okay, I can walk across here without getting my feet muddy. Nothing like that. No evidence that the concrete pad contributed in any way. Yes. But those have been preserved for action by this court. With respect to the signs, I think I'd like to close with something that the plaintiff said in the closing argument, because I think they said it better than I could. So remember they said Mr. Budd had to turn and his attention was held to the right. Remember him saying that? This little sign right here held his attention to his right, so he was distracted to his right. That's what they said. But what Mr. Budd told us was, I pulled up past that sign. I had a perfectly clear view to my left, right. I had a perfectly clear view to my left. It cannot be a substantial factor if Mr. Budd himself said it played no role in my decision. That sign, whether that sign is in compliance or not, had nothing to do with whether it caused the death of Lenny Chan. The plaintiffs, until the verdict and post-verdict settlement, took the position that this was entirely the driver's fault and consequently his employer in the course of scope. Uh, they only shifted that position once they had settled with the driver and the hospital was the last one. But I think that kind of sums up our position with respect to the sign. Um, unless the court has any questions, we'll stand on the briefs as to the remaining issues. Okay. Yes. I have one more, Chief. Um, on, uh, this is a case where we could take the opportunity to provide further guidance about when you balance under the Phillips factors versus uh, looking at categorical rules. And we have categorical rules of varying degrees of generality or specificity all over tort law. Um, what, what would you say, if we were to write and provide some guidance on that, when is a rule, when is a, a general no duty rule specific enough to the circumstances that balancing under the Phillips factors is not required? I think that's a very tough question for the court. One key is that Pagayan says 
that the question of duty needs to be distinct from the question of breach on the facts of a particular case. So I think what you need to look at is to keep the rules general enough that they're not saying, for example, when you have a hospital owned by somebody named HNMC and a plaintiff owned named Chan, that here are the rules applicable to that, because that confuses duty and breach. But it's, it's going to be different in different circumstances. Some circumstances will call for very broad rules. Some circumstances will call for very narrow rules. Um, and I don't have any general rule of thumb beyond what I just said uh, to guide the court on that. I think the Court of Appeals have done a good job of saying the general rule is no debt duty for adjacent property owners. Here are four exceptions. Maybe somewhere there's a fifth exception out there waiting to be born. Has this court ever embraced those four exceptions? It, it has not. But we have cases on each of the four. We, we haven't articulated them as four exceptions, but we have cases on each of the four. Don't we? That is correct. And we're now up to five courts of appeals that are applying the four exceptions. And you, you're, for purposes of this case, you're saying you accept those four as a given, so we don't have to worry about what the law is. But you're accepting all of those exceptions. So that's correct. The dissent did as well. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Young. We'll hear from the respondents. May it please the court, Ms. McCauley will present argument for the respondents. Mr. Chief Justice. Members of the court, may it please the court, I represent the Chan family and we are asking that you deny the petition and affirm the Court of Appeals. And now that I have heard the argument of my esteemed colleague, I can see that there are so many more concessions than I thought there would be uh, for me to tackle. I'm not sure that the import of those concessions comes clear uh, to the court because of the challenge about the evidence. It is not a coincidence that my colleague ends his presentation with the closing argument in the trial. A trial that they lost. A trial that the jury didn't just hold the hospital responsible. Indeed, the hospital was one of the fewer percentages. The jury found Harris County, the jury found Mr. Bud, the driver, to be more, much more responsible than the hospital. So when the hospital says to you, we have absolutely no duty and no good deed goes unpunished, because that's really what their argument is here today. They're still conceding to you that they exercised control over the interest, I mean, over the crosswalk that was between their two pieces of property. They concede, and that's if you go the exercising of control. They tell you that exercising control isn't enough here because the concrete pad or the sides didn't have anything to do with this case. They're making that argument to you even though there was expert testimony at the trial that in fact it did. It made a difference. Mr. Bud's testimony, and, and I, I don't mean to be into these weeds because the important part here is that the foreseeability that is demonstrated by the letters that the hospital sent to the county shows the court very clearly what the hazard was, what the risk was. The risk wasn't that someone like Mr. Bud would be reckless or that he would break the rules. But the, the letters, I thought, were not saying the risk from the concrete pad or the risk from the, the sound. It was the more general risk of this is just a busy street, and that is not something I don't think that you're saying maybe you are, that the hospital exercised control over that. I actually am saying that they did, and, and I would... I would embellish on actually the way that the court has presented it. What their letter said was that the risk was that the configuration of the crosswalk and the busyness and the cars coming out and the, and the pedestrians crossing was a conflation of confusion. The, because, for example, when Mr. Bud, when, when counsel says Mr. Bud, he, he, he inched out so that he could see his way. Well, sure, he might have been able to see left and right at that point after he inched out, but the problem is you still have pedestrians, and he's having to focus on looking left and right around a sign, He's ha and those pedestrians have been encouraged to cross at that 
abandoned crosswalk because of the concrete pad. All was of she, the, is there evidence that she was in the crosswalk, the, the abandoned crosswalk? Yes, Your Honor. I thought from the diagram that was in the record, she was to the left of, the, of what used to be the crosswalk as she was walking across well, the street. Well, it, it's an interesting point you make, Your Honor, <laughs> because it's, it is when you come out of the hospital, you then have to skew um, if you want to hit the crosswalk, but the concrete pad and the old markings of the crosswalk give the impression that walking across is appropriate. But when you leave the hospital and you go across there at the abandoned crosswalk right next to it, you are going to the parking lot also owned by the hospital where there's no pedestrian gate. So the, the pedestrians crossing from the staircase that goes down into nothing into the parking lot they have to go around the cars. So it's a funnel, I've used the word, it's a funnel straight across, even if their footsteps are not exactly on the crosswalk, because the photographs do show it's sort of skewed um, the way you have to do it. But that, what the hospital said is that those things put together, the pedestrians are still going that way. And the, the busyness of the intersection, it's the most busy street in the medical center, according to the hospital. All of those things put together, they have identified that as an unacceptable risk, a hazard that puts the pedestrians at risk and it needs to be fixed. They didn't just identify the hazard, though. And, and again, my, my esteemed counsel has conceded most of the Phillips factors, frankly. The, do, the do, magnitude you, do you agree, of the, counsel, do, do you agree that the, the background rule uh, is that there's no duty on the property owner to make an adjoining street safe. Couldn't agree more. And so if, if that is the background rule, and if, if what you're arguing is that the hospital's knowledge of and concern about the danger on the street gives rise to liability, I'm afraid that if we say that's how this works, that now lawyers will then advise people, don't word, don't think about it. Don't write that letter. Don't do anything to make it safer because then the courts are going to say, now that you've done a little bit to make it safer, you didn't do enough, and so you've got to pay for the accidents. And so we're, we're incentivizing people to uh, just cover their eyes and do nothing to the danger next door so that, because that's the only way they can rest in the, the background rule. I understand the concern, and that's, a, that's exactly what my colleague is saying when he compares the bystander to a good Samaritan. And I've given a great deal of thought to what I perceived would be the question. What if the hospital didn't have sewer cleanups? What if they did absolutely nothing? We know they didn't do that. But I can almost agree with my colleague that if they did nothing, they would have had no duty. Except one of the four exceptions is not, uh, isn't related um, to what he's describing to you. If you have the property of this is... If you're a good Samaritan and you, and you in, I'm sorry, let me back up. If you're a bystander, you're going to have no responsibility, no matter how much knowledge you have, off your property. But what one of the exceptions tells us is that you will nonetheless have responsibility if you know of an obscured hazard in the ingress and egress of your property. It is the obscured danger. And their letters, again, their letters say everything for us. Their letters tell us that the danger of the busyness of the intersection of the pedestrians coming at the cars is obscured. Told the county, the, these folks don't understand how dangerous it is. We keep having accidents. Nothing is changing. Obscured means that people don't reach the, the safety of the danger. I thought obscured might have been something that you want to look at. They actually can't see it, but there's nothing that is hidden from the view. That is, that's true. I don't, I don't see anything in the cases that tell me obscure. Um, let, let me back up and say it this way. What your balancing test would tell us is that the obscure looks a lot like superior knowledge. And so even if it's not obscured like it's over my eyes this way or it's concealed under the ground, what you tell us is that we need to balance the superior knowledge that is possessed by the person that we are considering the duty. But you said a minute ago that the, the good Samaritan or, or I guess one of the other characters in the parable that knows a lot and sees a lot and does nothing has, has no duty of liability. Uh, that's, it's, what does the superior knowledge have to do with that? I don't understand that. It's, it's just part of 
you're balancing the factors, foreseeability, um, you know, the risk that, that is involved, the likelihood of the injury. You tell us um, that that's that superior. Like duty is going to always be a, a question of fact based upon each individual case, based upon whether or not we can determine whether the defendant has something that a balanced superior approach. I think it was not excluded in the sense of obscuring it. It's plain as day for everyone to see, but maybe they knew about it. In discovery, what we have found, we have black diamond jewelry, every case. About duty? Because it, that, wouldn't it be better to have obscure just mean what I think obscure ordinarily means, which is hidden? It, it might. And, and Your Honor, I mean, I would back up and say you've already taught us um, in, in the cases where you are debating about the Phillips factors that we don't back into a duty. We don't say it looks like it, and so we're going to back into it. So that's definitely not my argument. But my argument is that because you have also told us that superior knowledge is something that you consider at, at a higher level for the category of the defendants, when you have a category of defendants like an abutting owner that knows that he owns both sides of the property, that is an individual that is by definition going to have superior knowledge without you going too much further into the facts. No, I, I can agree with that. But what I'm concerned about, though, is the idea that superior knowledge has something to do with whether a danger is obscure. Those seem totally distinct to me, and I'm still not fully understanding how they can possibly relate. I don't want to burn up all your time. But no, I, I think I think maybe I would turn back to sort of the human factors testimony. We have expert testimony on all of this. The, the obscurity is, according to this human factors person, is that with all of it going on at the same time, with the busyness as identified by the hospital, with the busyness of the intersection, the confusion and having to look around in order to to get out, the, the drivers never appreciate that there are pedestrians that are in the crosswalk. They just never appreciate it, and that's proven over and over again. So I do think you have to look at the facts you've told us. We don't go too far, but we have to go somewhere. So, so are you saying that the, the possibility that there would be people walking in the street was was obscure to, to drivers? It just seems like that's, that's an everyday part of driving, as you know, especially in a, in a busy place like that. There might be people in the road. That's why we don't look at our phones. It's just it's daily life. It's not, it's not obscure to, to drivers. It doesn't seem to be. I, I agree with you. I do not think it is obscure that there are pedestrians there. But what the hospital said is that it is, it is obscure. It is, it is not something that is appreciated. It is known to us, but nobody else that when you have the pedestrians and the drivers coming together in the way that they are, coming out of the parking lot and with the crosswalk, they do not appreciate. It is, it, it's very much like um, if you think of the 14th Court case, Golden Villa. In the Golden Villa case, there was knowledge that the individual who was impaired had a tendency to wander. And you will remember the case because that was considered under your Krauss um, adoption of 368. It was considered to be when, when the woman wandered into the road, that was something that was a landowner's duty to pull back, and they did not do it. So they had knowledge, and nevertheless, they allowed the woman to be in the intersection, and she caused the injury. What, what my colleagues are trying to tell you is that if you construe, if you construe your Kraus decision, if you stick with your Kraus decision, then it is going to open floodgates, and yet you've had you've had that Kraus in place since 1981. You had Atchison in place since 1945. There's not been a floodgate opening. They can't give you the hue and cry for why you need to abandon the notion that there's a general rule, and then you have an unless. Well, weren't those cases about if somebody actually uh, an abutting leader did something, let a tree from their you know, like from their tree fall on the road? Build something right up. There's people who had to walk off the side. Things that they affirmatively did to amplify danger, as opposed to just knowledge that you would get by having you know, been a landowner. I, I I agree with you that knowledge is not quite enough. But your Kraus case does not do what then the San Antonio court in Nama does. It doesn't suggest that it needs to be some sort of an affirmative act or a dangerous instrumentality that goes across your property line. It just ha says that you have to exercise. Was, was the Kraus case, did the Kraus case involve calling to flee as the building was being demolished? 
request did indicating affirmative action by the landowner. Um, so doesn't that suggest something different than what we have here? I'm not sure that it does because in the facts of the case, I guess you could say they were taking affirmative action by demolishing the building, but the actual act of negligence had to do with the way they were doing it. They, they failed to do it in the proper way. But I guess my point further would be, I'm not suggesting that Krauss it is the way that you analyze every single case on the facts. What I'm saying is that you have already decided that there is an exception. There's an exception to the general rule that a property owner owes no duty across its property. But when you think about, for example, uh, what the court has identified, um, creating or assuming the risk, these sorts of exceptions, first of all, you have indicated, even in your most recent United Rentals case, that it's not even about property. If you create the risk, it doesn't matter whether you own property or not. Well, isn't that uh, part of the problem here is that this was submitted only as a negligent activity case, and I realize that's not disputed, but a lot of these are premises liability duty cases. They're not negligent activity duty cases. Some of them are, and some of them aren't. The, um, uh, the Krause case was a negligent activity case, um, not a premises case, and uh, the assumption of, of the duty cases are, are negligent activity cases. So does that help us some, for example, in parsing this out? And, and I understand, again, the posture in which the case comes to us, but does that help us in understanding the scope of some of these rules and exceptions to say, well, this one is premises and this one is negligent activity? That's a great question. I'm not sure that it does. Um, I think you would still have the limit. Well, let, let me back up. I'm not sure that it does at all because I believe the way that Krauss has been written based on um, Section 368, I believe it identifies that your duty as a landowner, when the injury occurs off of your property, that is going to be reasonable care not to have created a hazard with your activities on your property. I, I think the way these cases have been looking at it, the ones that are doing negligent activity, I think they're saying, by definition, this is not premises liability because premises liability submits the hazard of the condition of your property. And for us to go a different direction on that, but you haven't spoken on that. Um, and fortunately, I don't think you have to cross that really hard bridge today since the parties have agreed on the body of law that governs. But the question is an interesting one because you, you then have to ask the question, if you're going to use premises liability law to do Section 368 work, then are we going to make the crosswalk, for example, in this case, are we going to make the crosswalk the hospital's premises for some purpose or for all purposes? Um, are we going to ask, was, uh, was the pedestrian that was in the hospital, is that person an invitee or a licensee or a trespasser? They're almost always going to have to be an invitee. So I think the analysis will become very difficult if we travel the path of premises liability. And that's certainly what was articulated below why the hospital thought it was a, a negligent activity case. It was tied to an injury that occurred off their premises, and they didn't have liability in premises liability. But the obscure danger line of cases sounds much more like premises liability. Uh, even though the danger was immediately off the premises, it was the way that the, the door obscured the step there, and the door was on the premises, I think. But if I remember of that case correctly, that sounds more like premises, obscure danger, and maybe one way to understand, if that's right, then maybe one way to understand obscure danger is sort of in, con in, in juxtaposition to open and obvious, because we've got a, a premises rule, open and obvious dangers, no duty, uh, but it, it, is that the way to understand obscure, that it's, that it's in contradistinction to open and obvious? I think it's possible because when you think about obs obscure, that's the only one of the exceptions that doesn't require an affirmative act, right? right? So just having the knowledge, I do think that would probably be closer, but the way the obscure danger has been laid out, it is it, it seems to have more to do with property that is, a, is a pertinent to. So I think you might still have some of those complications, but I agree with you that that one is much closer, um, but... But the 
case, the cases on obscure seem to extend that duty, that premises liability duty, into general negligence because it's a pertinent property not concerning the condition of the property. So I think that would still be a very difficult analysis. I, 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 want, I want to explain that the Phillips factors, I know there's a bit of um, question about whether or not the Phillips factors um, should inform a duty like this, but I do think the court in, in Menendez has recently told us that's what we want to do is we want to get a general category, which is what Section 368 is. It's that duty, exception to the general rule, the unless for creating a hazard off of your property. And then we need to look more carefully at the very specific duty that is engaged in the case. So this one is a completely unique case for you because it does have the hospital owning the property on both sides. They're an abutting property owner for both sides. And so that is a unique duty that we are asking the court to craft. And, and it's an easier duty than for, for them to say that the sky is falling, um, to say that a landowner now has an affirmative duty to act. Not saying that. I think in, in your Otis case, it's, it's a little different, but I think in your Otis case, that sort of taking your breath is what, what was going on there. Did, the, the employee was intoxicated, the employer knew that the employee was tox, intoxicated, and knowing that was not enough. The act was sending the employee home in a car. So if the, if the, the hospital did not own property on one side or the other, you think it would be a very different case? Your Honor, I see that my time is about to expire. May I? May I? Right. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I, I do think it would be a slightly different case because I think the fact that they are a, a sort of a, a, an abutting property owner squared gives them so much more control over that intersection. It also gives them control over funneling people in that direction. It's unlike then uh, the, the hyper. Habayashi case, it's unlike almost all of the ingress and egress cases where there was no reason to know about uh, the hazards that might be created by a truck driver driving out or something like that. But even in the in Hayabashi case with the barbecue joint on one side, it was a central point of the decision in that case that they didn't own the parking lot on the other side. It just gives a different twist for assuming duties and control when you operate in that intersection in the way that they did. When you identify the hazard and you have foreseen it, you become responsible for it. You have a duty to continue with what you're doing, follow through, get that action plan done. Thank you, Your Honors. Any other questions? Thank you. start with the superior knowledge versus instilled danger question. My learned colleague, I believe, has overspoken when she said that the letters to the county said these folks don't understand concepts to that effect. The letters don't say that. The letters say we keep having incidents here. Please do something. Uh, that indicates superior knowledge by the hospital as compared to the county sitting in their county office building downtown, it does not indicate superior knowledge as compared to pedestrians and vehicles using county drives. Does it indicate that an unappreciable hazard exists as opposed to an ordinary hazard? Uh, not on its face, Your Honor, certainly. Uh, it, all, all it says is we keep having this problem. This is a life safety issue. Please do something. Please do this. Please do that. In any event, we agree with Justice Young that um, obscure danger is a very different concept from superior knowledge. It, it is absolutely not sufficient that the adjoining property owner has superior knowledge of dangers on the adjoining property. A lot of the cases cited in our brief would be wrongly decided if that were the test. Is it more like not open and obvious in the sense of obscured in that sense? Well, I, no, I think there's a middle ground. I think there can be an open and obvious danger. There can be a danger that is there and can be perceived. And then there can be a danger that is so obscured that it is not possible to find out about it with reasonable effort. 
second, I want to turn to the supposed expert testimony that the signs were uh, a cause of the accident. Uh, it all depended, no, there was no video of the accident. It all depended on exactly how the accident sequence happened, and we had two eyewitnesses to that. The experts, therefore, had to make various assumptions. And the expert testimony was that once you moved, that if you stopped within the hospital parking lot, you could not see to the right. But once you moved forward with your nose into the street, then you could have a clear view to the left and the right. The expert testimony was that the vehicle had done that when the turn began. And consequently, and, and Mr. Budd said, I looked to my left, I looked to my right, and then as I pulled forward, I looked ahead of me, and I did not see Ms. Chan until I heard the thump. Uh, so that was the testimony. Obviously, expert testimony that is at odds with the established facts doesn't prove anything. But even the experts in this case said it would be possible to do what Mr. Budd said he did, and if you did so, you'd have a clear view to the left and to the right. Uh, Justice Busby, in answer to your question, the evidence was in dispute over whether this occurred in the crosswalk or not. One of the witnesses said we walked straight across. The other one seemed to suggest we started out uh, straight across and drifted over to the crosswalk. There was a lot of confusion and conflicting testimony on that point, so we don't know exactly where the collision occurred. Finally, I want to address this issue of the hospital as the property owner on both sides. If you think about it, a rule doesn't make a great deal of sense to say that if A owns the left side and B owns the right side, then neither A nor B have any duty at all. But if A owns both sides, then a duty arises. What happens if the hospital then conveys the parking lot to HNMC Parking Lot Incorporated? Does that change the, the duty rule? Or even if it's uh, the Acme Parking Company's parking lot across the street, uh, that gives the adjoining property owners no greater control over the street than they otherwise would have. Well, they're not actually adjoining property owners, right? Because the county owns the streets. Well, the county owns just, well, they're, they're adjoining the county road. That's right. Yeah. But they're not adjoining each other. That's correct. The evidence is undisputed that the hospital had no control over the crosswalk. It could not have restriped the crosswalk, removed the crosswalk, or done anything with respect to it. My time is up. Any other questions?